Hey brothers and sisters and YouTube family, hope you guys are being blessed. Um, I just want to continue with the message um, that the Lord has put on my heart, the series in regarding uncovering the sins of the church. And this video is about lukewarmness. And as I said, um, all of these, the Lord has dealt with in my heart and still continue to do so. And having me stay vig vigilant about that. And so um, I really wanted to touch on that um, because initially started the first video, we talked about jealousy, gossip, um, sexual morality, offense. And, uh, and so now we're in, so another one I missed, gossip. Yeah, okay, so so we're now on um, lukewarmness. And so the Lord even speaks about that so fervently and very sternly about that, even starting off in Revelations. A lot of times people read Revelations and think of the seven churches. And you think, oh, those churches were... Um, you know, those churches are historical um, churches, um, or or you could think that these churches are um, in the future. Somehow, in the future, we'll have seven huge mega churches, seven different churches that we can identify. But the truth of the matter is that we're living at Revelation right now, and so in God's words, Revelation means something that was hidden but is now revealed. And so, what the Lord's speaking about is a spirit of churches. It's, it's, it's a church. We are the church. Our bodies are temple of the living God. So he's not talking about buildings. He's talking about a group of people, the body of Christ. And so to be honest, if you can really look at your walk with the Lord, you can find out which church you're part of right now. The Lord's talking about churches right now, right now in this time. The seven churches in Revelation is talking about us, our generation. And so, as I said, and the Lord's so very strongly warning us about lukewarmness and what, what happens in that state of a state of a body or a church um, that happens too. And so we just go, I just want to dive in right to Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6. And the Lord speaks here, he talks about the church of Sardis. And he says, and to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, the words of him who has seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of God. Remember then what you are, what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know, or you will not know at what hour I'll come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not sold their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and then I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before the Father and before angels. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Amen, amen. And so, from, even from the scripture alone, I just want to break down ways to conquer lukewarm, lukewarmness, because the Lord talks about that in this particular passage just alone. And so, uh, lukewarmness is basically a state of our heart. A state of our heart getting cold, uh, being distant from the Lord, um, living a life of compromise. That's what lukewarmness is. And you see that so prevalent in the body. Um, in here, the Lord talks about that you have a reputation of being alive. You have a re reputation of calling yourself a believer. You have a reputation of being righteous. You have a, re a reputation of being religious. You have a reputation of being holy. You have a reputation of uh, being a Christian. But yet he says here, but you are dead. And that's kind of deep. And so I want to go into one of Ms. Claire's messages where the Lord actually speaks about that prophetic message where the Lord actually speaks regarding the warmness and how that happens. And so it says here, and so um, the question asked by Ms. Claire, I asked him, how does the soul become lukewarm? He answers, first and foremost, by pursuing the world and all it has to offer. Whether it be material things, status, power, knowledge, or friends, the more enamored you become with the pursuit, the more time you want to give, the less time you have for me. The pursuit of these things begins to pave the way of indifference to me. My children, even your own pursuit of knowledge, be very, uh, be very clever, so, uh, so careful that learning does not become an end in itself or distraction away from me. What I've called you to, guard your hearts carefully. Whenever you begin to veer off course, don't let it take precedence over you. What is most important to me, name the, our relationship and the outpouring of gifts I've entrusted to you. It is a form of entertainment and lifting you out of your current perspective. It's a form of relief, and I don't fault you for it, uh, as long as it stays in a proper place. Claire, you have much time. I'd rather you get busy with other things, but you may do a little reading between, uh, between as long as you don't let it get distract you. Keep you from your other work. I'll gently remind you time to put it down. It'll be excellent exercise and self-control for you. And it's talking about a book that she begins to want to read to gain more knowledge. And the Lord continues, My love, you've always been on one to go off on tangents, sometimes very good tangents with my direction, other times very destructive tangents that cause you to leave important things unfinished. 
that has been one of Satan's major dynamics to keep you from, from who I've called you to be. But as long as you're beaten to me and aware of the dangers, you have my blessing. Um, and it says here, there are many suffering confusion right now, going back and forth from condemnation to distraction, to allowing too many interruptions in their lives. When you feel badly about yourself, you tend to withdraw from me, and very often get busy in the best cover-up for what's really going on inside you. There's a super move of condemnation and lies go out about my people. Right now, I'm calling upon you, my bride, not to allow it to drag you out in the sea of distractions in the world. Any comfort you get, there will only be temporary. You'll come back, you'll come back to yourself a more distant than you did before. That is why I gave you that beautiful love letter last night. I'm trying to counteract these lies that are being spawned about you not being worthy, about me being dissatisfied with you. Lies, lies, lies. Most of you are bringing me mountains of constellations now. The enemy sees it and tries to cut it off. His entire existence is wrapped around being, uh, bringing me grief and hurting me, which he can only do through you or by hurting me or by injuring my beautiful creation. So I'm asking you to be vigilant, thoroughly convinced that I desire your companionship. I'm not the least judging or condemning of, of you, only warning and entreating you to spurn the distraction of the world. Spend time with me so I'm going to hold you tenderly against my heart. Be swift to come to me. Be vigilant. Do not listen to those lies. Amen. So see here, as the Lord even breaks it down himself, um, lukewarmness. You know, lukewarmness, it starts by a desire, a love for the world. So I want to go to 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. It says, Do not love the world or other things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour, and as you heard the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, know that it is the last hour. Amen. And so that's exactly what the Lord is talking about. Um, I think this wraps up so much because, guys, it is the last hour. Jesus is coming, and his desire is that we be about his business. And I remember one message he talked about that. It's not even by our words, but it's by our actions. If we're about God's business, if we're about his work, if we're diligently, diligently pursuing all that he's called us to um, to do, uh, everyone around us would begin to be actually believe that Jesus is coming back. So in this time, we know that the, the, it's the last hour. This is in God's word. The last hour, the Lord is coming back so soon. And his desire is that we will not walk in the flesh. We will not desire the things of this world. And that's what we talked about, sexual morality, um, offense, gospel. All these things are sins of the flesh, sins of our heart. And so the Lord's saying that if you love the world, then it, it says here, it says, for um, that is a world. So it says that if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. And so many times right now in the church, I feel like we, we've, we've got a love for the world and love for God. And God is saying to you that, no, that's impossible. If you love me, you will not love the world. You will not have a desire for the world. And how many times can you go in church now and we see everything almost like the world? That's one thing it just uh, grieves my heart because I notice that. It's like when I go into the churches, you know, it's like, man, it's, it almost looks just like the world with the slap Jesus on it. You know, we listen to same secular music. We may listen to clean versions, you know, during our young adult events. You know, and I'm just like, I'm confused. If if you have other believers, it's sad to have other other young adults or other young people who are so on fire for the Lord in China, in Syria, in Iraq, you know, in India, those who are sold out for the gospel, those who are devoted to Jesus and who are about his business, who are in the word, and they're able to come to a Western American Christian uh, churches here, they would be, they'll scratch their heads. Many of them do. It's like, I'm confused. This looks nothing like what I see in scripture. And this looks... This looks so much like the world. I, I don't understand why, you know, people are not living lives according to God's word, why they don't even know God's word, why, you know, it just become like a social club. And I think that's the biggest thing in the church right now is that many, many of us here in America, it's, it, the church has become a social club. That's what it's become. And so it just becomes a hangout, fellowship. We slap Jesus on it, but yet we're, we're still living and walking in compromise. We still love, you know, status. You know, the Lord talks about loving the world is loving status, loving friends, loving class, loving knowledge. That's all still in the body of Christ now. We were loving our friends. We want to fellowship all the time, want to hang out all the time, not spending time with Jesus. And then we love class. So it's all about, all about making money. It's all about ambition. It's all about even who has the, the best words of wisdom. Even if you're called into ministry, it's about, oh, who has the best word and who can preach the best and, you know, who knows more scripture. It's all about, once again, just knowledge, knowledge, and knowledge. It's, 
it's about who dresses the nicest, what outfits you wear, uh, you know, what cliques, who, who's that you hang around, who are, who are the cool people in church. All of this, to me, this is a form of lukewarmness, it's a form of love of the world. And so even the movies and things we watch, movies we listen to, you know, movies we watch, music we listen to, and yet we call ourselves the believers, and God says that, be ye holy as he is holy. And so right then and there, it's like, okay, we love the world, we love the world, and, and therefore we're not willing to detach ourselves detach ourselves from things of this world. And so God is saying that, you know, uh, with lukewarmness, one of the things that uh, continue to have, one of the things that allow lukewarmness to happen is the love of the world. So do you love the world? Are you still seeking after men's approval, men's validation? Are you still seeking after a certain level of class and status? Are you still seeking after those things just because of what the world, what the world will think, what the world has to say? And so if you are, then that's how you become the one. You begin to distance yourself from the things of God. Because uh, things of God will always call you to sacrifice, always call you to deny yourself, and always call you to follow Jesus and not follow the world. The second thing is condemnation, just like the Lord talked about. And I didn't even know that until I read that message. So condemnation actually will begin to um, it help perpetuate lukewarmness in our lives, in the life of a believer. And that's uh, if you go to 1 Corinthians 11, 32. Go 1 Corinthians 11, 32. So 1 Corinthians 11, 32 says, But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So we have to understand as believers that when God judges us, when God disciplines us, you know, it says in Proverbs that he disciplines those he loves. So when he disciplines us, then why run from him? And I think uh, just Lord is saying that when you, when you find yourself getting to worldly things, being about worldly business, you know, being about things of the world, what happens is as you begin to walk with the Lord, as you walk with the Lord and as you begin to just be consumed with things of the world, right, it distance you from God. And as it distance you from God, the enemy just completely comes in and pelts you condemnation. Oh, look how far you've fallen. You're backsliding. And that's what Lugorma says, backsliding. So you're backsliding, you know, uh, you can't come to God's presence. He's mad at you. How could you do that? You call yourself a believer. All these different lies of the enemy, he causes you to walk in condemnation. And when you walk in condemnation, what the Lord desires is that we run to him. The condemnation immediately allows us to run away from the Lord because we're like, he's mad at us. He's probably not listening to our prayers anyway. What's the point of following Jesus? I'm going to stumble and fall anyway. I might as well just continue to go more and more in the world. And as you go more and more in the world, you become more and more and more and more distance away from the Lord. Your heart becomes colder. It no longer burns for things of the Lord. It no longer understands the things of the Lord. It no longer desires the things of God. And that's exactly what happens with condemnation. But it says here in, in Scripture, 1 Corinthians, in uh, 1 Corinthians I mean, 11, 32, God's saying that when even I judge you, when I when I'm giving you that same conviction in your heart that hey hey my my daughter my son your backsliding come back to me it's because of discipline because I love you I'm disciplining you so that um you come back to me I'm disciplining you so that you draw back to me that you're not condemned you're not condemned along with the world so there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus so condemnation causes us to continue to distance ourselves from the Lord and before we know we're just completely backsliding backslide to things of this world, backslide to the luxuries and the desires and the comfortability and just kind of conforming to everyone around us. God has called us to be set apart from the world, but yet it's so easy to just get comfortable and conform with all those around us, those friends around us and, you know, what the world thinks is okay, what the world thinks is it's good. And then before you know, you're sitting amongst the world, but yet you're called to be set apart. And the last thing, of course, is uh, lukewarmness. It leads to death. It leads to death. That's what it leads to. It leads to spiritual death. And then it's going to lead to physical debt too as well. You losing your soul and your salvation. And God desired that none of us would do that. So the scripture where the Lord talks about uh, being hot and cold, Revelation, back to Revelation 3, 16 through 18. says, so I was, um, he says, so I will spit you out of my mouth because you're, you're only warm. You're, okay, it says here in the scripture where the Lord talks about he spews out of his mouth. He says, I will spit you out of your mouth because you're only warm and not hot or cold. And so that's a very, very stern warning from the Lord that he will spew us out of his mouth. To be spewed out of the mouth of God, I don't know about you, but I, don't, I would desire, Lord, help me not to be spit out of your mouth. This is for you're neither hot nor cold. And that's what lukewarmness does. You're neither hot nor cold. You're just kind of the middle. You're living a life of compromise. And so that's exactly what compromise, um, compromise happens. So first you, you love the world. You begin to live a life of compromise. And then you walk in condemnation. 
and the way you walk in condemnation that causes you to distance yourself from the Lord because you feel bad, you feel judged by God, you feel like you're not worthy, you can't come to his presence, he doesn't love you. These are all lies from the enemy. That's exactly what lukewarmness begets. And so the end of it all is that it's death. It, 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 it causes death in your life. It causes spiritual death. Just as the Lord says that you could love the, what profits a man if you gain the whole world and lose your soul. You gain the whole world and lose your soul. What's the, what, what, what is the point? What's the point of having all of this? As the word of God says that, uh, as we're read here in First John, that the desires of this, the, the earth is passing away. So what's the point of desiring the world for it's passing away? The earth itself is dying. So you begin to seek after things of the world. You're going to die with it too as well. And so as a believer, it's so important that, guys, we don't walk in compromise. We don't walk in compromise. We don't look like the world. We don't dress like the world. We don't talk like the world. We don't watch things like the world. We're, world we don't listen to things like the world we don't react like the world you see all of these things cause us to be lukewarm and backslide because we look just like the world yet we slap jesus name on it and that in return then causes people to walk away from the church because like these people are not serious i know how many times in my life now with my walk with the lord i've got some other believers who are like no no i just think you're just taking your walk with the lord just too extreme you're just too extreme i think it's too extreme i've heard you're too serious I've heard, you know, uh, insulting words like I'm legalistic, re uh, religious, all of these lies from the enemy, speaking from meaning to well-to-do Christians. And one thing I remember just coming to the Lord, I was like, Jesus, I want to be sold out. Like, I want this word to come to life for me. When I had the revelation that Jesus Christ is real, I felt like a, such a deep knowing in my spirit, like, the Bible is where everything happened, and God says greater works we would do, and signs and wonders. My heart has always been seeking after this. There had to be something that God created in me that's been designed since I've been little. Since I've been little, I've been seeking after God, and I want to know that he's real. I want him to speak to me. And when I got the revelation, I had the radical encounter with Jesus. My life has never been the same. And it doesn't make sense to me for believers who, who, who say they know God and then give their lives to Jesus, and your life does not change. That's what I'm saying. It's like a Jesus is real, guys. If he is real, that means his word is true. Give him all that you got. What's the point of holding on to your life? Follow him with all that you got. Give it all that you got. Completely devote yourself to this way of life, to the word, to eternal life. Devote yourself to it. And if you're not going to devote yourself to it, then you're kidding yourself. Don't walk in compromise. Don't walk in lukewarmness because it's not a delight. It's not a blessing to the Lord. It's not a blessing to other believers. It's definitely not a blessing to the church because what happens is that you yourself, by your testimony, by your life, you begin to actually draw people away from God because there's no difference about you. There's no change about you. You just become another religion, basically, and another God in the name of Jesus uh, or a, a God that, that, you know, like I said, literally just another God amongst other gods. So then people want to find different ways that works for them. And you hear that statement a lot. Well, I'm just going to find some works for me. But if they see God, if they see Jesus Christ working your life, they see that you're serious about his word, that you are passionate pursuing him, the faith that you walk in, they're like, man, this per you must really, I I've heard that too, <laughs> even my walk. Everybody's like, why are you so, like, why are you so confident what you believe in? It's like, because I know him. And the other's are like, man, you, even other Christians have told me, it's like, man, you're really serious about this. Yeah, are you not too? Like, I don't understand. And I think that's a, the biggest that's the biggest, um, I guess that's the biggest, how can I say this? I don't say question mark. But I scratched my head a lot with that because I'm like, and that I get so much more pushback from non-believers, not non-believers, but Christians. Christians who try to make me feel a certain way because of my walk with the Lord or because of my life. They get convicted and therefore they try to push me down to their level. Oh, just live life a little bit. Compromise here. It's okay. God, God's not that serious. You know, he's not that serious. He doesn't care what you eat. He doesn't care, really care what you watch. It's okay to have a little bit of fun. To me, sounds like the enemy. That's like what the enemy said. It's okay, Nana. He's still cunning. It's okay to live a little. Just give him a little bit here. Guys, that's exactly how Satan starts. Is one compromise. One open door of compromise in any area of, our, of your life. That's not holy. That's not edifying. That's not pushing close to the Lord. That's not pure. One area of compromise. And the door is open. Before you know it, you're walking with warmness. Your heart becomes cold. You don't desire the things of the Lord. You're completely backsliding. And then you're running away from God because of the condemnation that you're walking in. And it's all the pull of the enemy to set up from him. So come out of that. So as we as we want to continue forward in lukewarmness, how can we conquer that? Number one is to repent. Repent if you find yourself, as you're hearing this message, repent. If your heart has been in a stage of this hardness, if your heart has been in a stage of coldness, if you've been living a life of compromise, be honest with yourself. Repent. Repent. And so if you go to Revelation 3.19, that's exactly what the Lord tells the church to do is to repent. So Revelation 3.19, the Lord speaks here. He says, 
to those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. So be zealous and repent. God is standing at the door of your heart right now knocking. Repent. Repent and turn back to him. He loves you so much. And so get to as well. I love what he says here. He, he gives pointers as to how to overcome the woman. If we go back to Revelation 3, talking about the church of Sardis, he says, wake up and strengthen what remains. Wake up and strengthen what remains before that dies. So right now, you have the spirit of God in you. You said yes to Jesus. You have the seed of salvation planted in your heart. But you haven't allowed it to grow because you walk in a compromise. You've been loving the things of this world. And you've been distant from God. And what God is saying is that wake up. Wake up before that seed, that seed of salvation that was planted in you dies. That can die, God. You know, God, die, guys. I hear a lot of times where people are like, oh, well, you know, once saved, always saved. I don't believe that. I don't see where it's nowhere in scripture. I, I do believe that as you get baptized by the Holy Spirit, he seals you. But I think that's even a true part to salvation. First, you have to give your life, say yes to Jesus, confess with your mouth, and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you will be saved. And second to his will, the Lord calls us then. He says, pick up your cross, deny yourself, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. So that's a two-part to salvation that God has called us not only to just profess and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but to actually follow him too as well. And when we follow him in obedience, he baptizes with his Holy Spirit. And that was me, guys. For 29 years of my life, I was a Christian that walked in lukewarmness. I was a Christian that had not fully surrendered to the Lord. And so when the Lord says, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow him, he's calling for a place of total surrender. Many Christians have co professed and confessed, oh, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, but is he Lord of your life? Have you surrendered to him? And if you have not surrendered to him, then it can be very likely that your salvation can be, you can lose your salvation. You can lose your soul. The word of God says that to work at our salvation with fear and trembling. If, if, if we were always, if maybe we confess and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and we had salvation right then and there, God wouldn't say work out your salvation. God's desire is to work out our salvation, complete surrender. We sold out for him to allow him to be Lord of our lives. That's what he desires, to repent. Repent and ask the Lord to bring you that zealousness back again before the little that you do have, uh, the little that you do have, um, have in your heart dies. And then thirdly to as well, it's holy, uh, thirdly, to, thirdly to as well, it talks about waking up and strengthen. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and what he means by that. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always known in the work of the Lord. I was abounding the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So that's what he means by wake up and strengthen what, uh, what remains. Abound in the work of the Lord. Be steadfast in that. Knowing that all the work that you do for God, that your labor is not in vain. So the, the, the second way how to conquer Luke Romans is be about God's business. Are you building your kingdom? Are you building his? Many believers, we give our lives to Jesus and then we build our, for 29 years, guys, I, at age of 14, I gave my life to Jesus. So I'll say for 15 years, I was building my own kingdom. It was about my success. It was about my, uh, it was about my honor. It was about my gratification. It was about my glory. It's about my uh, mogul mentality, my, my empire that I want to build, my empire. And that's as a, how many believers have that mentality? It's about us. It's about us. It's about us. And before I surrender to the Lord, our lives is all about Jesus. And so now I'm just all about his business. I'm out of work right now, but I'll say I'm working for Jesus full time. And he's very, very, he's very, very steadfast, very, very steadfast and uh, diligent and disciplining in that area of work. Just like I think a couple of days ago, three nights ago, um, I had a date night with the Lord. It was so beautiful and so sweet. I had the most sweetest time with him. I felt his presence so strongly. And afterwards, I just, uh, I felt like I was just cuddling with him on the couch. And I just felt like I was on his chest, just like I would, you would, just like a husband and wife. And I was like, you know, Lord, I just like, I just want to watch a movie. Let's just, we just had an amazing time of worship. Let's finish this off with a movie. And I just remember in my heart thinking, like, no, I feel like you want to do a YouTube video. But I'm like, Lord, this is such a sweet time. Let's just like, rest and just have fun in each other's presence. And I was like, you know, let me ask a little for Rayma. So I clicked the ask a little for Rayma. Hilarious. So the Rayma said, oh, the, the, Rayma, the, the Lord's Rayma said, day and night you toil for a trifle. So why not do it for the highest, most honored for me? And so I had to go back and go, what's a trifle? So if you rephrase it, he's like, day and night you work for a treat. That how much more will we do for the highest honor for me? So it's like we work for we work for what we work for likes, we work for followers, we work for popularity, we work for money, we work for status, we work for class, we work for comfortability, we work for security. Um, you know, we work in order to um, seek men's approval. 
we work for all of these things. So why not work for Jesus? So of course, two o'clock in the morning, I've set my tail down and we did a video. Me and Jesus did the video together. And so I was just like, man, Lord. And so he's been so firm that like work, work, work. And you know, the eyes of others may be, they may look like, oh, your, your relationship with Jesus is based upon work. The word of God says faith without works is dead. So that's to understand you walk in intimate relationship with Jesus and not religious, it's obedience. And that you have to understand that he's going to hold us guys accountable for our lives. He's going to hold us accountable for what we, every word we said. He's going to hold us accountable for every intention upon our hearts. He's going to hold us accountable for our time. He's holding you right now accountable for your time. What are you doing with your time? Right now, the Lord has delayed. He's been so merciful. He's given America and the whole world more time until he comes. So he said three years. Now two, one year is almost gone. You have two, two more years left. What are you going to do that time? Are you going to be about your kingdom? Are you going to be about your success? Are you going to be about what your family thinks? Getting your family's approval, your parents' approval, your, your friends' approval? Are you going to be about getting Instagram approval, Facebook approval, getting popularity, being famous? Is that what your focus is on? Because guess what? You're going to come at the end of your life and realize it was so worthless. Again, everything I desired. And before the, the God, the creator of the universe, the one who created you, the one who gave you all this time and gifts, everything is worthless. And you have nothing to show for your life because you lived for yourself. And that's what lukewarmness does. It causes you to live for yourself. And so God's calling, calling you right now and calling us to wake up and strengthen what you have. Abound in the work of the Lord. And be steadfast. Be diligent. Do not give up. Because you have a position. Your flesh will oppose you. The Satan himself and the demons will oppose you. Your mind will oppose you. Your fa family and friends will oppose you. Do not give up. Be steadfast. Abound in the work of the Lord. Every hour, every minute you get, be about God's kingdom. Be about his business. That's so important. That's how your zealousness and your desire and your hunger before him begin to grow. And last but not least is definitely holiness. Holiness. That's exactly what the Lord's been doing in my life is personal holiness. Holiness, that, that causes you to conquer lukewarmness. There's no way to be lukewarm and to walk in holiness. It's impossible. Because holiness is all about sacrifice. It's all about denying yourself. It's all about walking with Christ, coming more to deeper intimacy, and coming more into the presence of God. As the word of God says that, be, he, be ye holy as he is holy. A lot of times I hear that and hear pastors say that, people say that. But it's like, I don't understand what does that mean to be holy. I don't understand what that practically looks like. Of course, you know, the meaning holy needs to be set apart. But okay, what does that look like? What does that practically look like? And that's what the Lord has been teaching me. It's been so painful. And it's a very difficult process. But I think the Lord, he said, at the end of it all, we'll have supreme happiness. I'm believing that. Because I'm walking into what God has created. I was I was born to be holy. I wasn't born to walk in a sinful nature. That's not, I was never created to be a sinner. I was created to be holy. And so it's, it's basically coming out of that sinful nature, crucifying your flesh, and walking into what God created you to be. And so sit here in Psalm 119.9. Um, how can a young man, and it could be for a young woman too, young lady watching this, keep his way pure? This is by guarding it according to the word. Amen. So you can sit here, how... Can a young man or young woman keep their way holy? Because holy purity is holiness. And so it says by guarding it according to the, to the to God's word. And so are you living according to God's word? That's how you can conquer holiness. Are you living according to God's word? God's word is not a, a two-minute sermon. God's word is not a, good, a feel-good message. God word, God's word is not something to receive every day, every Sunday at church, and then walk away and do absolutely nothing with it. No, God's word is life. God gave us this book, guys, from cover to cover to show us, to teach us, to equip us, to encourage us how to walk out in Christ's likeness, how to walk out in what we're created to be. When, we, when I read this word, guys, I read it and I realize this is who God called me to be. This is when God said, let there be Nana. This is who God created me to be here in this word, all of from cover to cover. This is who I am. It's not what the world says. It's not what my feelings say. It's not what my flesh says. This is who I am. So, guys, you must live according to God's word. And I, I believe that's what it's like in the church. Is that many of us, like I said, we can we can quote scriptures. We can post things on Facebook, post things on t-shirts. We can give a good, good sermon. We can get a Facebook Live, on Instagram, on YouTube, give a great message. But are you actually living this word out? Are you just giving a two-minute, two five-minute, 30-minute, hour-minute message? You know, um, from what from your not logic understanding. But it's about living this life out, living according to God's word. That's how we live in holiness. That's what holiness is. And so I love reading God's word because it cuts my heart. It convicts me every time. I don't read it and just like, okay. You know, I read it and I'm like, man, God, I want to become that. I'm so far from that. And that, and his word actually becomes my prayer because I want to pray and actually become this word. And then we go into about uh, being, uh, you know, being detached, detached from the things of this world. That's what holiness is. So he says here. 
Luke 6, verse 20. He lifted up his eyes on the Sabbath and says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their father do that to the prophets. But woe to those who are rich, for you receive a consolation. Woe to those who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to those who laugh now, for you shall mourn. Woe to those who, when all, all, all people speak well of you, for so their father do so for the false prophets. Ouch. But I say to you, hear love, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. From one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic. Give to everyone who begs of you. From one who takes away from your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish others would do to you, so do this to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that for you? For even the sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that for you? For even the sinners do the same. If you lend to those from who you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies. You do good, lend, expect nothing in return, and will be great. And you be the sons of the Most High, who's kind to them, grateful unto the evil. Amen. Guys, I love that. Like, read that and pray, like, Lord, help me to become that. So the point of being insulted, you know, you're insulted or involved, and yet you still you still walk out in love. You know, when people speak negative against you, you still walk out in love. If you're poor, the Lord says if you're poor, yours is the kingdom of heaven. You, you are blessed because of that. It says here, you know, if, if someone strikes you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. It says somebody steals and robs you. It says here, if somebody steals and robs you, give it all away. Don't withhold anything back from them. If somebody robs from you, is it takes away your cloak, do not withhold your other tunic. Do not uh, do not withhold other things that they desire to as well. It's it, 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 like, that's such a deep, it, in the eyes of the world, it makes no sense. Imagine if somebody robs you. Somebody robs you, you're like, you know what, they're going to take my car. All right, go ahead. Go ahead and take my wallet too. Take, take what is, give to them whatever they desire. That's what God is calling us to give to them whatever they desire. And it says, if someone ever begs from you, uh, from one who takes away from your good, do not demand them back. So that's what the Lord is saying is that, yeah, so uh, so it's talking about if somebody borrows something from you, your tunic, like it borrows from you, give whatever they ask for. And it says, if somebody robs you, don't ask for it back. Don't ask for it back. That. Guys, like I said, that's so backwards from things of the world, right? Because it says somebody robs you, naturally what you can do, you're going to make a post about it. Um, you're going to make flyers. You're trying to get whatever is taken from you back. And God says, whatever is taken from you, realize that I allow that and actually allow them to take that, allow them to take that. And I like here, it says that even if, if somebody desires, if somebody asks you for something, you know, give without repayment. Wow, that's so far from the world. The world is like, we always want to give and we expect that. We give and we even loan and with interest. And Lord's saying, even if you loan, don't give interest. If somebody asks anything of you, give it to them without repayment. Don't expect anything. And so always walk out in the mode of love. So if you do these things, lend and be generous, generous and expect nothing. Then you look like your father who's in heaven. That's such a high calling. It's only by the grace of God that anybody's able to actually fulfill this word. And God, that grace is available. And that's what holiness is, that you're set apart. Because when you do these things, guys, they're going to be like, you are so weird. Something is wrong with you. But I want what you have because it doesn't make any sense. And you walk in peace and joy and love. And there's something about you because the spirit of God rests upon you. And that's how you are holy as he is holy. And so and you look like a father in heaven. And last but not least is God's calling us to be light upon a light upon the earth you know to conquer lukewarmness after you you repent you wake up you become about god's business you're pursuing holiness you're detaching yourself from things of this world you're trying to live out god's word here um as he's calling us to to truly react and speak and talk just like him to lend and give in generosity and 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 get to all who act then we become a light upon light in the world we become a city upon a hill that's how we're set apart and that's why people come to look to you and say, what is the hope that you have? What is so different about you? You don't really act like the world because, you can tell them, because I know my Father in heaven and he dwells within you and me, in me. 421 said, and said to them, is a lamp brought into, is a lamp brought in to be under a basket or under a bed? Not that I understand, for nothing's hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except from coming, for it to come to light. If anyone, okay. So it says here in Mark 6, Mark 4, 21. God says here, it, he says to them, is a lamp brought into be put under a basket, under a bed, and not on a stand? For nothing's hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to the light. And so the Lord speaking here is that 
Would you hide our lamp? Would you hide your light up under a basket, under a bushel? Would you hide your light? If we truly are the light of the world, that's how we, we blaze for Jesus. We blaze for Jesus in what we do, what we say, how we act. And that's why we see a, uh, God's desire is to see a body, a bride, a, a people who are on fire, who are zealous for him, who are so that who we devoted to him. And therefore, people begin to clamor and want what you desire. We begin to, people come out of the world that are weak, that are worried, that are broken, that are so desperate need of hope, that are so desperate need of the love of God. And they'll come into a church and be like, man, these people are serious. These people really love God. Not only do they say it, but they really need it. And your life's reflected. Everywhere you go, you become a light. And that's God's desire, that we all become a light, a city upon a hill, a light that cannot be covered covered at all. We burn for Jesus in a dark, dry land that's decaying. And so uh, that's the Lord's desire against lukewarmness, that we'll be zealous on fire for him and live in lives of holiness. And so I pray that if you see lukewarmness in your heart, if you see uh, you see your heart getting cold or just if you're backsliding, repent. Repent immediately and ask the Lord to begin to draw your heart back to him. And to heal your heart, to soften your heart again for things that soften his, um, to begin to break your heart full of bricks his, and begin to see from his perspective. So I just want to pray for you guys. Father, I just pray right now, Father God, from all my brothers and sisters, all these watching the video, God, I pray right now, uh, just for a spirit of repentance, Lord God, of contrition, Lord. I pray that we re repent from backsliding. Repent, Father God, of desiring things of this world and pleasures. I pray right now, Father God, uh, for a zealous spirit of, of fire. Just, Holy Spirit, your fire to consume the hearts of those watchers. Set them on fire for you. Let them be zealous for the, your word, Lord God. Let them be zealous for your ways, for your word. May your word truly be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray, Father God, that any of those who backslide will come out of condemnation or shame and run into your loving arms, Lord, knowing that, Father God, you're ready. You are there for them, God. You love them. You never left them or forsaken them, Lord Jesus. You have amazing plans for them, God. So I pray, Father God, for your body in general. I pray, Father God, that we come out lukewarmness, we come out of compromise, O Lord God, and we'll be hot on fire for you, Lord God, that truly people may see our lights, Lord God. And Father God, truly, God, be drawn to you, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. God bless you guys.